Yeah, so, yeah, so we'll do a right. one. Um, Dwight's not here. I'll call down to the lounge. So you want to be ahead of me all the time. Yeah, I'm keeping You want to be pulling me up, not me pulling you down. So I keep the delta around 15. He, so yeah. Science, do you want to update Dwight on uh, recovery time at one? Sure. Thanks. Bridge nav. Uh, bridge, we're starting our recovery to the surface. Uh, be at on surface at 1300. All right, current's too strong for me to try and bring it around, so we're just gonna live right there. Great. There's a lot of sand coming out of that. Yeah, oh, there is. Tube core. That's too bad. Uh, do you want me to move the ship, or we'll deal with that when we get well, I think we deal with it later. Okay. Yeah, that tube core is like... Yeah. Ooh. Oh, no. It's too bad. Is it the front one or the second one then? Hard to tell. I think it's... Yeah, I can't zoom in on it. Yeah. <laughs> you get what you get there on the view. Looks like the second one to me. Yeah. Uh. Which... That wasn't the great one anyway, right? We're losing some sediment here. Too bad. Did you happen to see what we're having for lunch? Uh, for lunch, I think we're it's a gamut, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I let Dwight know. He said it's pretty much what he had on the board, so. Perfect. Good. You guys know it's daytime outside? Is it? Yeah. How long have you been in here? I don't, I've <laughs> eight days. Last they night. don't let me out. <laughs> We haven't been here at sea for eight days, have we? <laughs> no. no. How long have we been here? <laughs> I don't know. Seven? Seven days? Has yeah. it been? Yeah, uh, I think it's been seven days. Really? One week. No, it can't be seven no, days. I don't oh, think so. What? Six days. We, we're only getting our five-day oh, relief here today. So. Six. Oh, yeah, that's we're right. Today's days. the fifth day. Yeah. We the most the important day. day. On the ship. <laughs> oh, right, because, uh, yeah, because Annie came... Tuesday that, morning. Right, yeah, and that's yeah. when we started the clock for... Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you just made it. Yeah, Hello. I made it. <laughs> okay, I need to do something about this hair situation. <laughs> I'm stuck again. Mess. How do you get from American Samoa to Honolulu? Is that a direct flight? Direct flight. So yeah. it's about five and a half hours. Uh -huh. Yeah, Hawaiian Airlines, of course, is our only um, airline. I oh, like that airline. Yeah. Not a sponsor. <laughs> Not a sponsor. Could be. <laughs> yeah, I don't like this whole... We're just spinning around. I can move the ship. That could help. But yeah. You want to go forward a little bit? Yeah. Uh, well, if, if the ship can do that. If the ship can't go forward, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, true. We have <laughs> issues. <laughs> we have bigger directly fish to forward. Fry. We can do. <laughs> it's more the uh, the crabbing. Okay, let's let's do it. Do you want to stream forward or do a step? Uh, yeesh, yeesh, 
Yeah, yeah. It's stream. Let's see what we've got in our uh, policies here. I think Rennie's belief is that the surface current and the subsea current are so different that you shouldn't bother with trying to move ahead. But I cannot get around, so I don't want it to just keep going. Right? Yeah. And like trying to crab is both not working and sucking up a lot of power so that we could use to come up with. going on there and that all those stringy things oh. two cable ties hmm. so that's pointed all the way back you need to point it more forward Probably good for now. I'll, just, I'll zero it there anyway. Yeah, that last uh, position where you were doing the rocks, I was looking at you from the from the stern. We do have viewers asking, if it's possible, is there any way to adjust the main camera to look out more into the midwater, please? Mm, not at the moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're keeping an eye on the rock on the front porch to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. So I'm gonna slow down a bit. Yeah, slow down some. We don't wanna be that much. You just start sucking me in. You're not moving too much. You wanna just wait until we get a little higher? What do you mean they're not moving too much? Well, you're not... Yeah, you're not I'm trying to get over and I'm not getting over. I see. If I go past, then we're going to be running over each other. Okay, so try... Well, right now, if you move ahead, we're yeah. going to run over each other. So let's not... I don't know. Maybe the current will change. Yeah. Oh, let me look at the ADCP. Let's see what we got. That doesn't kick in until you're almost on the surface anyway. Yeah. ADCP. Yeah, lateral is not doing anything for us. We did speed up a bit. So it's locked up, you can't get to it still? No. Nope. Data lab nav, data lab nav. Hey, can you unlock the uh, EK80 screen? Thanks. Roger, thanks. Yeah, we're not, I'm not able to access it up here. Has anybody tried Maryland crabs? We have viewers shouting out 
that their Maryland crabs are the best. <laughs> Maryland crabs are the best. I would disagree. I would disagree. <laughs> really? are, are you thinking Dungeness? Try. Absolutely Dungeness. 100%. Wait, what's the best? Dungeness crabs from the northwest. Ah. Oh. What makes it the best is the question. More meat. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Very sweet. Lots of meat. Yeah. I want crab. You like that better than king <laughs> crab? <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. I've had king crab uh, fresh, uh, pulled from a hole in the ice out in front of uh, Front Street in Nome. Uh, and from the ice hole? Yep. What? There. Um, oh. Yeah, Whoa. I've had cream crab so fresh that it was uh, still kicking around when we put it in the water. And uh, and it's good. It's okay. It doesn't have the flavor that Dungeness does. The long legs have long pieces of meat and that kind of stuff. It's kind of stringy. Mm. Oh. And uh, doesn't have the uh, sweet crab flavor that Dungeness does. Mm. Uh, you are making my mouth water. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I went crabbing in the uh, Sayusla River, uh, the mouth of the Sayusla River, just uh, a couple months ago. Oh, nice. I've had it twice. Once in the Coast Guard. Wow. And once with Alvin, we collected some king crab. Mm. Yeah? On a what? Alaskan, yeah, it was an Alaskan uh, fisheries guy. He was aboard, and he just wanted to measure them. And we got to keep them and <laughs> had them for dinner. Nice. Wow. Cool. wow. Nice. We did the same thing with halibut. <laughs> <laughs> I shot a... And, and uh, come and say that you're all wrong. Oh, ah, well. <laughs> Vel <laughs> velvet, <laughs> velvet swimmer crab. Really? Velvet. Velvet swimmer crab. Swimmer. Small. <laughs> and, oh, uh, we have another viewer tuning in. Uh, Florida stone crab for the win. Oh. <laughs> I've never... Wow. Stone crab are good. They're mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, but it's mostly just the claws. With the Dungeness, you can eat everything. Wow. Mm -hmm. Look, yes. I'm making some headway. But I'm uh, I'm willing to go to Ireland and, and give it a try, my friend. Oh, yeah. No worries. You're always welcome. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I would love to. It's not, it's not. It's actually not very popular. It's a, it's a, it's a small, small swimmer crab, uh, velvet cover on its back. And uh, yeah, beautiful. Just Boil it in salt water and uh, beautiful flavor. Well, now that's on my list. On my list is something to try. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met anything that came out of the sea that I don't like yet. Uh -huh. no, no, really? Uni, uni is a challenge. Uni. uni. Oh, I have another challenge too. So yeah. like every year around November and October, um, Amer we have this, it's a polychaete worm, it's pololo season in American Samoa. So it comes around the full moon, the tides are really high. So yep. uh, the island goes around like 12 to 3, 4 in the morning with their nets and they'll collect these polychaete worms and we eat them as delicacy. We cook them in butter with fresh taro, fresh ulu. Yeah, that's oh, another. Wow. They're good? They're really good. It's because a delicacy sometimes in the Because anything you like cook in butter, it's like the butter that you're after, not the uh, thing. No, no, it's the, the flavor. It's oh, okay. It could be an acquired taste, but it's a delicacy in the Pacific Islands. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Pololo season. What to, what time of year is that? Uh, November, last last week of November, beginning October. Okay. We might be in Samoa about mm -hmm. that time next Let's season. Let's go. Yeah, it's the whole, it's, it's a really, it's, it's an amazing thing to be a part of. The whole island gets together and and goes, goes out, out and fishing collects, late yeah. at night. Oh, nice. Huh. Fun. So you said with uh, taro and yeah. what was the other thing? Oh, taro and ulu. What's ulu? Breadfruit. Oh. Yeah, breadfruit. Okay. Oh, that's so nice. What is breadfruit? I love that. Breadfruit's kind of what like What does it a, look and taste like? It's. Do you fry them? Uh, no, we put them in the umu um, or the let's like a underground oven. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. I love the breadfruit. Wow. Like starch. Mm -hmm. So it's taro and and breadfruit that we have with our food. Mm -hmm. And uni. I hope you guys enjoy uni. <laughs> We're gonna have to try it. Sounds interesting. I do like oysters, yeah. so I'm kind of intrigued. Okay.
Well, the, the less we have to slow down, the better. Like, like we're already in a deficit. But I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe just through the the part that's bad. I don't know. <clears throat> you think going slower helps it? Might do, yeah. Just for two reps. Try and get it seated just there and get it over to the drum end. We'll see. I really don't want to have to stop and go back down. That's no, 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 there'll be no stopping. The Hopefully they'll just run, run with it. So when is our next estimated dive? Uh, I think it's going to be kind of like eight hours after we're up on deck. Ah, oh, OK. So sometime tonight. Do we know how long this one will be, the next dive? The next dive will be similar. Uh, this What was this one, about 20 hours? 20 hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we'll, it'll be yeah, similar. Yeah, it's a little long for a dive. Hmm? Is that long for a dive? No, typically on this ship we do kind of 24 hour dives. Oh, oh okay. okay. And how do we uh, determine the depth? Um, Where to start? Yeah. Uh, or how deep to dive? Yeah, so, so basically we'll determine it based on the morphology or the geography of the C4. We'll right. try and start lower on the seamount and work our way up uh, to the top. And so, you know, kind of keeping in mind that the deeper we go, the more tension there is on the wire. And so it'll depend on the weather and all that kind of stuff. And we'll try and arrange this one so that we're coming up, you know, from east to west, which seems <sighs> To be the orientation that the ship has the least trouble managing the, you know, the wind. So, by any chance, do we know like a specific deep sea current that is usually around this area? Uh, We're entering the ITCZ, right? <laughs> yeah. So, the, so the, yeah, I don't think. I mean, in like El Nino years, maybe, but down in the deep sea, I don't know where what currents we're looking at here doesn't get that deep yeah so you know mostly i don't know 
They're not as controlled by those those types of things at the surface, um, which are wind driven in large part. Yeah, I'd say the flow is more uniform, but will change um, based on like like seamounts, for example, will change the flow of water. I'm guessing that's what helps to have biodiversity there. The yes, absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah, the because seamounts uh, like rise through the water column, you'll find a lot of different organisms living at different depths, um, and the flow of water will be different at different depths as well and around different um, contours of the seamounts. Um, there's also a lot of upwelling me, around seamounts as well. Oh, okay. Which will um, bring like nutrients what? from the bottom um, upwards. Awesome. And that's one of the objectives, right? To Are see if, the, if it down? varies between seamounts? Well, yeah, that's something that um, mm -hmm. Brian Kennedy is interested in, is uh, looking at different features of seamounts and, uh, you know, trying to figure out if there are, like, certain species associated with different features. That would be really interesting. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in addition to um, upwelling, there's also marine snow falling through the water column, which is like material from dying, decaying, pooping organisms at the surface. Um, and this provides a food source to, to these organisms. Um, there are also organisms that uh, uh. We picked up they six, eight wraps there. Yep. Uh, I don't know how you say this. They do or exhibit like deal vertical uh, migration patterns. No, you're, you're oh, okay. So down they down move um, like well, up and down in the water column here, uh, based <coughs> on um, <coughs> based on the time of day well, or like amount of sunlight um, to avoid predators yeah. and also to, to feed. Fix that. Yeah. Um, is that so related to the scattering player? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Awesome. Yeah. So one of the things that led to the discovery of this layer right. was um, that ships were using sonar to determine the depths of the water column. Um, and it would... Oh, hold on. Ah. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, yeah, so all of a sudden it got really shallow and they're like, what is happening? Um, well, it turns out that these waves were hitting like this dense wall of organisms and like being like returned to the ship. So it seems like it was really shallow, but it was just because there were so many organisms in this one layer. Wow. So it yeah. could get really dense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's called like the scattering layer or the ocean twilight zone um, and they help to move carbon and nutrients um, they help around, to they help with like mixing wraps and you know you're doing what really cool no, I'm, I'm down to 1.5 now yeah. I'm swinging around now Okay, 
giving her the beans again. Can we, uh, yeah, you'll see Alright, zeroed. Coming up. We're at the hey. bad spot <laughs> on the drum. It's Oops. slowing down. Uh oh, Adam, I hit something. Because of the current. We're all good now. Uh. Wait, we got the uh, came back in. The rap came back in. We need to stop. Stop. Take the rap out again. It spun back the other way. All right. Uh oh. Yeah. Sarah and Pepper, um, Sarah without an angel will be here watching. <laughs> <laughs> You're at the watch scene? Alrighty. Alright, uh, once I get the beans out, uh, once I, really I get out of the wrap no out, idea. I'm going to throw an auto, auto head in, yeah. I fixed it. Well, okay. Just throw it Bye, everybody. Once you get straight there. Yeah. And then I'll try and stretch it out. Okay. Zero. Half thrust are off. Just go past it. Go past it because it wants to come around that way. Well, just go past it though. Keep go going. past it? Yeah. Because it wants to just spin it right back the other way again. Okay, you can leave okay. it there. It was auto head. And, uh, well, you needed the other thruster, but that was just because of the current down low, right? Go, oh, because you had a yaw fixed in there. You know, like if you hit the yaw button, it'll just keep going. No, no, it wasn't that. We had well, that's what happens. If you if you click a yaw, it'll keep the button, the the ball, keep going around and around and around. You have to hit zero to get rid of it. Okay, so we're at the bad spot though. I don't know. It's up to Mike. What do you want? Hand over now or you want to Oh, we might as well hand over now. What can we do about that? We're just going slower through the that spot, but people are freaking out because we're going to be late. So. Just, just for the two wraps, but we need to, yeah, we need to get going. <laughs> Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is Sarah. Um, I will be, I guess, the expedition watch lead on this, at least for the next hour or so as we ascend. Does that mean I can go? Apparently, cool. yeah. Dwight is hanging in for a little bit, but as we ascend, there's kind of not much going on. We might see like a jelly um, float by, but we'll be ascending for, I guess, probably another hour or so as we finish up the previous dive. And we're also currently just navigating a watch change. So yeah, hang in with us and maybe we'll see some cool things. And I'm Danu, your SPO host, and I'll also be taking some questions as we're along for the ascent. I'll be taking questions until we hit about 100 meters. And then once we get 100 meters, then we're going to let the engineering team take it from there, and the RV will be back on board. Yeah, um, I know, I'm not sure how long ago we went over what we've picked up. Um, Loopy, I don't know if you want to go over that. I think I can, off the top of my head, I know that our 
arm here is holding a big rock that wouldn't fit into our sample box. Yes, um, looking at the previous um, documentation, it says they got a angular iron oxidized rock. Yes, yeah, some so. sort of orangey splotch there that I, a biologist, have no idea what it is. Well, but, um, we also have a brittle star on there. Yeah, too. let's say it says brittle star attached to rock. Yep. So 40 centimeters by, it's like about 40 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Cool, awesome. But yeah, it's getting some VIP treatment because it was a bit too big for our um, available boxes. Yeah, we were watching it on the screen uh, inside the lounge, and I'm just thinking, man, that's a big rock. It is. <laughs> it's going to be fun to cut. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll get my rock cutting experience this time if I bribe Adam. Same. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, but um, trying to think what else we've captured on this dive. I think we've also gotten a stalked crinoid that was a pretty dominant species of the area that we were surveying. Yep. Um, Loopy, is there any documentation of what else we've um, they captured? Actually, they took the they took it? Yeah, they took the documentation okay. just to get ready for um, <clears throat> her coming cool. on board. But um, yeah. some of the stuff I remember is just like uh, more rock samples, small yep. ones, um, other large ones as well. Oh, um, there was a sea star. Yeah, we took a sea star. Can't remember what type, but it was like a pretty orangish, pinkish one. Um trying to think i really have no idea other than that but we yeah, did some, some cool niskin stuff. samples oh yep um, niskin samples for edna and then they took some core samples of just the sandy bottom were there um, any sediment samples as well um i mm. think they took some cores right or no was that the last one uh, not entirely sure yeah i'm not It would be easier if I had the documentation in front of me, but. <laughs> so I have a question for the ROV team. Go ahead. So how have the waves been on this expedition uh, down below? Has this still been an issue since we've been down there since last night? Oh, with the winch? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of an ongoing thing. I think it's just the, the amount of wraps that we have on there. We just have to be careful in this corner. Maybe it's something that we can get worked out when we go deeper. Some underwater troubleshooting wouldn't hurt. Sorry? So basically some underwater troubleshooting wouldn't hurt? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, it's the to do with the winch and the winch hold, but we need to get we need to go deep to get that amount of cable off. Yeah. Yeah, right now all we're doing is um, ascending from our 20-hour dive. Ooh, some little polychaete yeah. floating by. Um, but just ascending from our 20-hour dive, we had some technical difficulties when navigating some currents, but otherwise we've, we've gotten a pretty good look at what's down there. Um, we've gotten some awesome rock and bio samples. Right yeah, it's a great second dive to our season yeah, so far so good. um and generally our objective for this expedition is mapping the, the biodiversity and geology of the pacific remote island area and specifically we're looking at the region just outside of the um, national marine monument we are okay. still in the eez zone which is the economic hold on i'm blanking Exclusive economic zone. Oh, there we go. I have yep, the mixed up. Exclusive economic zone, mm -hmm. um, which is also up as um, this area is for being proposed as a national or a marine national sanctuary. Oh, 
I love the little things that um, wiggle on by that we can't quite get an ID on, it's but like still fun. Um, but yeah, being proposed as a marine national sanctuary. And if you see what you like, I mean, if you like what you see, if you see cool things, if you have any input, you're more than welcome to post, um, well, get involved in the discussion and get invo involved in this proposal like by submitting a public comment. On one and side. that link is posted in our first um, blog for this expedition, I believe. But yeah, everyone is entitled and it's a really good way of getting involved with this sort of thing, even if you're just a, a citizen scientist or aspiring citizen scientist. Yeah, after we ascend and retrieve our samples, we're due for another dive um, in a different area, but basically doing the same thing. Um, this next dive will not include any laser instruments. We're just surveying the seafloor again, taking rock samples again, and doing some bio samples. So yeah, stay tuned, and I think that dive is scheduled. The descent, I believe, is at least scheduled. I mean, the navigation towards the area is scheduled for uh, 1.30 our time, which EST is, oh gosh, math. Okay. EST is about 7.30. And coming up will be our third dive on the ship, correct? Yeah. Okay. And you might be asking yourself, why should I care? Why am I watching this uh, ascent? <laughs> Which, right now, we're not looking at anything particularly cool other than we can appreciate the technology that allows us to do these sorts of dives and the technology that allows us to hold this rock as we ascend. Um, but generally, exploring the seafloor and measuring biodiversity of the seafloor is really helpful in informing decisions like that marine national sanctuary proposal and also just figuring out how things live on the seafloor. Um, deep sea communities are super different from shallow water and terrestrial communities. So there's a lot of different ways that organisms adapt and evolve. And by surveying and generally figuring out what the community composition is, aka what lives in there, the dominant species and types of organisms living in that community, 
by figuring th these things out, we can better understand how we can protect and conserve and um, better inform other organizations and other research about the deep sea. It's kind of like the space of Earth in that a lot of things are completely unique. Um, there's absolutely no light down there. The light starts to dissipate after 200 meters. So um, by the time you get to like 1,000 meters, there's really nothing down there. So um, deep sea corals, for example, do not have zooxanthellae. They are completely um, on their own. They get nutrition and energy just from detritus, marine snow, um, some chemosynthesis. Um, there's a lot of work being done with their microbial communities figuring out how their bacteria differs between species and even interest species um, bacterial communities between like populations. So yeah, a lot of cool and different things and we really appreciate you joining in even though we're just ascending right now. Um, if you have any questions, Daniel's over here with our questions and you're more than welcome to submit um, or just any comments, anything that makes you excited, or here for. Yeah. Yep, we take all comments, just as long as they're rated G. <laughs> and speaking of the ocean being like an entire environment out in space, many of the new technologies that we have on our ROVs are actually being tested in the ocean for potential use in outer space. One of those is sponsored by one of our partners, Impossible Sensing, and it is a Raman spectrometer. Raman spectrometers work much in the same way that you might look at a piece of steak and you're like, okay, I know exactly what's in there. There's like protein, there's nutrients, and just by looking at it, it can get a nice reading on what's in the composition inside. And that instrument can help not only with understanding what's on the ocean floor, in particular what we're looking for is a uh, ferro manganese crust, can also help us understand what lies below other oceans on other worlds. Out in space, some of our plants in our solar system have moons that contain oceans underneath the icy sheet, such as Europa and Enceladus. And they are targets of potential uh, space missions where they're looking to send instruments down under the those frozen oceans to examine what could be there, whether there are any signs of active volcanism underneath the oceans to make them melt, or even potential signs of life. So much of what we do down here is as a test bed for the final frontier. So what's the coolest thing we've seen on this dive so far? Oh wow, um, I'm not gonna lie, I've really kind of not been paying attention past <laughs> our watches just because I've kind of been sleeping, but from what we have seen on this watch, um, I've really liked all the sea cucumbers. Um, it's been really interesting for me too to see the difference in um, crinoids that we've seen because crinoids, stalked crinoids or sea lilies have been kind of the dominant um, type of organism that we've seen on this seamount and um, there were two different types. One had more of a yellow stalk and one had more of a darker stalk um, and they may, honestly, we, we don't know what uh, species they are or even if they're the same species, just different phenotypes, um, but I think they were different species given that they were located in pretty different areas. That yellow stalk type was pretty much um, dominant um, exclusively in the more upper um, levels of the water column that we were 
looking at, and then they were also on kind of the rocks more, and the darker stalked ones were more in the sediment of the deeper parts of the water column. I think it was like they were more common around like 2300, and then the yellow ones were kind of dominant from like 2100 to like, I think when did, I think we got down to like, maybe it was 2200 to like 2000. Can't quite remember, but that was pretty cool. Um, anyone else have anything they really liked? Um, for me, uh, it was seeing like the different type of eels or so that we were trying to point oh, out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was really, and the then like this fish fun. as well. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing the little shrimps that had like the long legs and stuff. I've never yeah. known for like shrimps to really have long legs like that. So Yeah, I second that. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, Lupe, you saw sharks outside the boat. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. Yesterday, yeah, that's awesome. before I came so in, it was a, a white tip um, reef shark. It was beautiful. That's awesome. That's so cool. I've awesome. been like scouting the sides, but haven't been successful yet. So fingers crossed that I get <laughs> your same luck. Yeah, ever since the other night when I saw the mahi mahi fish. And I think that was a peak for me, but yeah. what I'm hoping to see is a hammerhead shark. Yeah, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm excited to see some sharks. So I got a little well, Lupe said that she saw them when they were, because we had the light out on the boat, yeah. and so they were attracted by that. And so I'm going to yeah. poke my head out at night and see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's normally, right it's normally around like our, our second watch. Mm -hmm. okay. It's really around that time when they, like, you just look on the side of the boat and you just start seeing just different animals coming up pretty much. Yep, it's much better than uh, watching flies be attracted to a light at night. <laughs> yeah. Other uh, little critter that we saw that I thought was really neat was the sea star that had a lot of arms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that, that was, was really awesome. cool. That was so cool. I also like that little sea star we found that was tucked in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. The little pillowy guy. Yeah. Nice color on him. Or it. Yep. And I think I was working on an ID for the shrimp earlier. Um, I think their general, um, let's see, let me just make sure I get this right. I want to say their family name is Nematocarcinidae. Um, looks pretty similar there. Yeah, it does. But there's a whole bunch of those too. I have no idea what their long legs are for. No idea why they're adapted for <laughs> long legs, but they're pretty cool. It's it's reminding me of like the spider, the granddaddy long leg spider. Oh yeah, yeah. like a really bigger body. But a shrimp. <laughs> yeah, just a shrimp. So elegant. Yeah. <laughs> So we noticed that a lot of those shrimps have long appendages. Do you think that's an adaptation from being down there in the dark? Much like uh, how many cave creatures have long legs but very small eyes? Um, I mean, so from what I can remember about deep sea shrimp adaptations, um, they learned that, I'm not sure if they were eye spots or if they were the actual eyes, but um, there was a study done to see, to figure out whether shrimp use their um, those features for communication and they actually didn't really find much for that. Um, their, I mean their eyes are definitely sensory organs, um, of course. Their legs, probably not. Um, maybe they have some sensory features on their legs, but their legs were probably, if I were to guess, just for better locomotion because of the lack of... Sometimes there's a current in the deep, but not as much. Um, so they need something to better get around and scavenge at the bottom. Um, but that brings up another point of that um, a lot of organisms in the deep sea, we actually don't really know what their adaptations are for. Um, one of the good examples of that is the Magna Pinna squid that we were talking about earlier. Those long tentacles, we don't really know why they have them from what I can understand. Um, we're still figuring that out. So another reason why our work is so critical to understanding deep sea ecosystems and evolution. 
It's always a way to ask some really good questions, too. Yeah. Do you happen to know uh, what depth the Magna Pena uh, squid kind of reside in? Um, off the top of my head, no. I want to say that they're deeper, but yeah, they are. They can, so, let's see. Um, there was a sighting at 2385. So they can get quite deep. Wow, nice. Um, I believe there was a sighting at like six, oh yeah, 6,200-ish. Um, so they're kind of more of a deeper species. But I'm not sure of their range. All right, Daniel, do you have any jokes today? Yeah, Daniel with the jokes. Jokes, jokes, jokes. 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 <laughs> this is what this watch is for. Uh, this one's kind of corny. What goes good on a um, ocean salad? Uh, um, a sea, sea cucumber. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Just made that one up. That's a good. That's one. good. That was so original good. content. <laughs> Post lunch thoughts. So someone in chat was uh, commenting on our uh, uh, shark sighting. They say that it may not have been a white tip reef shark, but maybe an oceanic white tip. Great distinction. We are getting closer to um, Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll, but not quite there, so makes sense. Oh wow. Yeah, that would be wild to see off the side of the boat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> The well, one, well, the the one I saw, one was small, and then the other one was kind of a little bit bigger than that one. When I you saw two, yeah. Oh wow! But I only got a video of one. It oh. also happened to be the small one. Oh, fair. <laughs> yeah, fair. It's really cool, regardless. Yeah, one of the privileges of being on EV Nautilus is that you get to see a bunch of critters in their natural habitats. Which, for one, I kind of just, it's something that I'm like, oh yeah, things live in the ocean, but I, you don't really fully understand that sometimes until you see it, um, especially with living on the East Coast where I just have the Schuylkill River, not much is in there. <laughs> yeah, for me, I'm close to the Potomac River and it's mostly just freshwater fish, nothing interesting. Once you get towards the Chesapeake, things start to diversify, especially when it comes to uh, freshwater mollusks like oysters and yeah. uh, other bivalves, like clams. Yeah, the Chesapeake Bay was actually my first encounter with like organisms that weren't like, you know, microscopic sh shrimp and like fish. Um, because last summer I worked at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science for a um, research experience for undergraduates program, which is really cool, really awesome. Um, yeah, I did an REU too. Those are really valuable experiences. Yeah. Yeah, super grateful to have that opportunity. But um, my cohort members and I, we like went to the beach one day and stepped in the water and I saw a tinafor and I was like, tinafors are in the Chesapeake Bay? I thought that was only an ocean thing. And it was just kind of like a really wild experience for me to have. But I don't know if we've seen any tinafors yet. They're usually more um, mid-water column organisms. Um, there's some deep sea ones, but... Maybe we'll see one float by on our ascent. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. That one siphonophore we saw in the first dive was really cool. Yeah. I wish we could have gotten an it's idea like on that. It's like a chandelier. It was yeah. so cool. So cool. But we can only hope. <laughs> it's really a game of luck during the ascent.
but yeah, we're currently during, um, in the middle of our ascent, ending this dive. Um, we're at 662 meters, and I'm not entirely sure what, um, what the like depth per minute is right now. I want to say that's the delta depth number, but um, I think we'll be to surface in probably half an hour or so. And that's when we will collect all our samples, preserve them. And you can watch that too on the um, wet lab camera. Do we think there's anything else we're going to see in the uh, Hercules feed? Maybe be able to move the camera around a bit. Sorry, Daniel, what was that? Oh, if there's anything else we, you think you might see in the uh, Hercules feed, if we can, like, maybe move the camera up a bit. Yeah, I don't know. Perhaps. Yeah, maybe something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah, I think they're wanting to watch the rock. Yeah, yeah. we gotta keep Don't the rock. Don't fall, rock. The VIP rock safe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really interested to know what that, um, that patch is, though, because Adam was saying that he's not quite sure what it is. Um, it's a little shiny, so. Yeah. Really interested, as a non-geologist person, I'm really interested to know. Well, the color kind of makes me think it has some iron content in it. Oh, there's a um, um, siphonophore. Ooh. Oh, wow, oh, look, look at, at that. that. Oh, we got one. Well, that's a Kodak moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are my favorite. Yeah, they're really cool. Their siphonophores can look really, really unique because um, just the way their colonies are organized are so different between species. Um, if I guess a little um, summary of siphonophores is that they are jellies. Um, well, actually, let me check that. Um, but they are colonial organisms that kind of just drift around in the water column and they um, are colonies of little um, individual animals. Oh yeah, they're um, herd of hydrozoa, right? So they're they are Nigerians. Oh. AKA um, related to jellies, but they're really cool organisms. Um, if you have ever heard of the Portuguese man o' war, that's also a siphonophore. With that kind of name, I imagine a large yeah. critter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or a colony of critters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they do have stinging cells. That's why Portuguese man o' wars hurt if you touch them. If you see a little floating thing in the water, if you're ever in like the tropics or um, Bermuda, um, and you see something floating that's kind of jelly-like and purple, get out of the water. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> but um, yeah, siphonophores are one of the cooler organisms in my opinion because of their phenotypic diversity. And they can come in all pretty colors, too. Oh, some sort of jelly. Floating by. Oh, I just looked up the Portuguese man o' war. Whoa, they're yeah, cool. Yeah, isn't it awesome? <laughs> but they hurt. Wow, <laughs> yeah. They have super long tentacles that you can't see um, under the water. They almost look like plastic black, yeah, plastic like, yeah. bags floating on top of the water. Yeah, some kind of swim bladder type, just mm -hmm. keep it floating. Yep, exactly. Yeah, the conoderms and the darians are some of my favorite sea creatures. Just how yeah. unique their body plans are. It's mm -hmm. so different from anything we've seen on land, especially.
So when we ascend to the surface, our samples are immediately going to a wet lab. Will our uh, viewers be able to get a chance to see us in there? Yeah, that'll be on channel three. Yes, yes. absolutely. You'll get to see me. Yep. And Sarah. Also, oh. And Leela, I believe. Yeah. Um, it'll be me, Guadalupe, Leela. We'll be putting the samples in jars with 95% ethanol, unless they're a rock, because rocks do not need preserving. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, you'll get to see us working at the bench. Nothing too amazing, but it is quite fun to see the samples um, with color. Because once you put things in ethanol, they're color bleaches. Oh, oh look at that. Like heat. <laughs> but yeah, um, if you get to see any deep sea or generally like really any marine samples or aquatic samples preserved, oftentimes the ethanol completely bleaches their color. Um, some things retain their color, like I've seen Paragorgia or the bubblegum coral. They can still um, remain pretty pink, but a lot of things retain little to no color. So I'm curious what's up with some of the cameras. Looks like a party. Sorry if you just lost a camera back there. I'm chasing ground oh, faults no, no, no. around. You're, no, it's all good. I just, I'm looking at the monitor in front and I'm just like, that's a party. Right, to announce, masks are optional. Oh, Ooh. yay. We just received the mask optional. As oh. I'm currently taking off my mask. So. <laughs> We are COVID free. Hooray, no plague on the ship. <laughs> I'll probably keep mine on. It feels like I still have something in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually forgot to check my teeth. Oh, post salad. It's okay. But yeah, we did have some COVID protocol just to stay safe because we are still in, well, in my personal opinion, we are still in a pandemic and I'm not sure if we'll ever, <laughs> we'll ever come out of having virus outbreaks um, from now on in my personal, ooh! A okay, then that's a big what? one. What? That is, Awesome. It almost um, looks like a protein. Yeah. We're finding so many of these. Um, that is a particular type that I don't remember the name of, but let me see if I can find it. I think that that looks really similar to the really big long type that they found in Australia. Um, let me see. Obviously, it's really difficult to get um, perfect IDs <laughs> right now, or in general, because IDing things can be really tough without getting an up-close or um, genetic sample of it, but you can always try. So, from what I can tell online, this might not be accurate, but I'm trying, ooh, a jelly! Um, I knew I was going to see a jellyfish at some point. Yeah. yeah. Looks like that siphonophore could have been part of the genus Apolimia. Um, looked really similar to that really big siphonophore found in um, 
off the coast of Australia a bit ago. How long was that? Um, let's see, it was... Please hold. It looks, they estimate that it could have been 390 feet long. Wow. Which is huge. That's 119 meters. Really big. That's a good distance for you and uh, Hercules to ascend or descend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder how old and how that creature would have been. Yeah. You know, how, um, like the growth rate per year or... I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> but um, probably pretty old. Yeah. I think if I were to study marine biology, Siphonophores would definitely be... Ooh, there's another one. one. Hello. Similar would to what we be, saw before. Yeah. Yeah. The area of study for me. Hey, front row, if y'all could just kind of update me a little bit of what's going on for the data logger. Are you guys holding up there? I think so, but just want to get a confirmation for data collection. Oh, no, it looks like we're still descending, perhaps. They're figuring something out, but um, looks like we're holding. So our dives attract viewers from all around the world, and we are reaching to you live from many different places. Most of our viewers come from the United States, so welcome aboard. And we got a few from Canada, United Kingdom, and New Zealand. Welcome aboard. We even have some folks from Denmark and Czech Republic, and all the way up in the Netherlands, Dutch country.
For those of you just tuning in, welcome aboard the Exploration Vessel Nautilus. We are currently sending from our ocean dive on Onion Guillot. We are north-northwest of the Kingman Reef, right outside the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. We are in the process of concluding our 20-hour dive under the ocean. And we are on the first expedition of the season, which is NA-149 to the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atolls. So welcome aboard. I'm back. As I took my short little break, I looked over the side for sharks. No sharks. No. Just um, blue. <laughs> but I do have a question. What yeah. is, you see the ROV grab, what do you, what is that um, that it's holding? This thing? Yeah. That's just a rope. <laughs> oh, it's just a rope? Yeah. Okay. I was going to point it out earlier and be like, oh, look, a cool thing, a rope. But, um. Nice. <laughs> yeah. As we're ascending, sometimes it'll like come up and you'll see the tassel side of it. Okay. But yeah. We're just holding right now, navigating some ship movements. Daniel, anything fun for messages? Any questions? Yeah, sure. So I think you were all mentioning something about that shiny piece of the rock right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That could be some iron oxides that are coating the rock. Cool. And that could be something expected when we're looking at the kind of crusts we are. Yeah. So uh, these ferromanganese crusts can actually form from the water column. And because of that, they form, I believe what are called, ferro-oxy-hydroxides. Mm. And that's a big chemical word, but if you think about it, that says that most of the chemistry down here is related to water. So you have oxygen, hydrogen within that. So if we know how rust is made when we have iron attracted to air and water. That oxygen likes to attach itself to the iron and that's how we get iron oxides in iron oxides make a nice rusty cover that we see on this rock. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Kind of see something drifting in the distance. Hmm. Might be another siphonophore. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Come closer. Drift towards us. I feel like I'm just itching to 
take a nice highlight image of it. Yep. <laughs> what do you want me to do with it? Nothing. <laughs> oh, Tele. Me? Tele. Hmm. Yeah. So many of our viewers at I'm home trying. are interested in, maybe interested in a career in marine science. Power cycle. Can some of you tell us how you had how a pathway cam. into the Off. current field that you're in now? It right. just holds the last image, does it? I'll go. Did I get the right one? It's pilot cam, right? On um, again. So... I, once again, living in the East Coast, but not quite Jersey, not quite a state that's next to the ocean, aka Pennsylvania. You want the network bottle cycled? Um, did not have any exposure to marine science. Um, prior to my sophomore year of college, where I joined the one and only deep sea oh, lab yeah, in okay. area, in the Philly area. Um, <laughs> And then from there, um, it kind of just combined a lot of my interests of evolution. Are they staying still um, now? Cool new things that I've that people yeah, have okay. really never seen before. Um, I didn't really have a specific interest coming into college. I just kind of knew I wanted to do something with bio. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> I knew I didn't want to be a plastic surgeon or a dentist. And are they happy um, on the bridge now? I didn't really learn much about geology, which looking back, Maybe I kind of check in with them, and then we'll continue um, if we're all good here. And I just kind of fell into it, which, from what I've heard, it happens to be a lot of people's um, ways yes, of getting into yeah, marine yeah. science, unless they were, like, born on the shore, always lived by the shore, knew they wanted to be a marine scientist. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of fell into it, started looking for more opportunities. Um, and then found my place eventually. Ha I had a huge network that was able to support me and really, really monumental in getting me where I am today. Um, and yeah, that's how I got here, basically. <laughs> how about how about you, Daniel? Yeah, so I was always uh, a big science geek growing up, and. I was just fascinated with the world, especially the oceans. Um, what really fascinated me was uh, outer space, but the oceans are just as mysterious and alien as outer space in many ways. And yeah. Growing okay, up, are they going to go forward at half a knot? Growing up, I would visit the uh, Baltimore the National Aquarium mm. in Baltimore, Maryland. Let's go at po yeah, whatever you got them in doing so now. Awesome. You got them doing point three, I assume, right? Never been, but I want to go. It's a really nice aquarium, man. They're always adding new yeah. things. Yeah. Like, the only time I've really seen a shark was uh, in a tank, so it's really nice okay, to see some out to here coming in up a while. Bridge. All right, we'll yeah. come up. About uh, 19 meters a minute, I think. Some sort of floaty thing. Floating around our way. Probably another siphonophore. Yep. But, yeah. You apologize to the RV team. Don't mean to talk over you. Okay, see how it goes. But yeah, so uh, I was always had that curiosity, especially with the deep ocean. I, you know, watch movies like Finding Nemo or SpongeBob growing up and see what it's like in the uh, shallow ocean. But the deeper down you go, it's more and more mysterious. Like it, it just fascinates me so much. Like how and we see in Siphonophores drift by. And much of what we understand about the uh, makeup of our planet, geologically speaking, uh, comes from the ocean floor. It, most of the ocean floor is made of what's called oceanic crust. And it's, con it's most of what is the coverage of our planet. I could go on a whole diatribe about oceanic crust. And as a geologist, I do find it very fascinating. But uh, to get back on top of about my story, it... It always felt like I had that interest that I wanted to delve into, but I was never sure if that was a career path that I, I wanted to go into. But I always wanted to try it out, so when the opportunity for Nautilus came along, I already felt that, wow, 
I could really try something out that I've always wanted to do. And what got me there was uh, a, a road plan that really kind of ebbed and flowed in different ways. So in college, I was going for aerospace engineering at first, but then I switched to geology, feeling that it would be a better fit for me as an uh, outdoorsy person, also feeling more of a scientist and an engineer. And this took me to a job working at a national park where I was at Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah, working as a park ranger intern. And I really got to find an interest in science communication, just talking about my love of science and everything about the natural world and discovery. And this opportunity for Nautilus came along as uh, one of the many geology societies I'm a part of was giving out a uh, job listing email and I found this on there and it just felt like a perfect fit. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. Um, for me, um, I've always wanted to be a veterinarian and just growing up, that's what I always wanted to do is help animals. And it wasn't really till like college when I realized, hey, it's a lot of animals and opportunities you can work with. It's not just, you know, the basic cats and dogs. Um, you know, part of me wanted to work with, you know, a larger scale of animals such as like the marine life. Um, but it was just like a really tiny thought of mine. Um, oh, looks like there's a little something. Yeah. What was that? Something mm. on screen. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. But um, so yeah, being at Tuskegee University, um, I joined the Ocean Exploration Club recently, and I went on a field trip with them to the Marine Center um, in Southern Mississippi. Um really fell in love with what I was seeing out there, just networking with different scientists and everything. And um, we even visit the aquarium and stuff there. So it was just like amazing seeing. Um, so it really just sparked my interest of maybe this is something I want to do. Yeah. So applied for internship and here I am on Nautilus on my first expedition. Yeah. Yeah. Super privileged to be here talking with you all today. Yes. So if you all uh, who are watching us live today are ever interested in uh, joining an Nautilus team or interested in ocean science, you know, check out our website. If you go under education and or join, you can find uh, our listings for internships and jobs and careers. Usually applications open up in the fall, but we're always looking for fresh new talent, whether that's scientists, engineers, educators, we're looking for people from all over, even artists to come on here and help interpret the ocean in many creative ways. Little fish just went by, but yep, we're um, slowly ascending or cool. Yeah, and our estimated time to surface is 20 minutes, but we are battling some um, some ship problems just with getting the ship, making sure we can safely get Herc and Atalanta back up. So when we do these expeditions, we include people from all around to help us with our mission. And we're not just including scientists, engineers, teachers, and artists. We're also talking about crew, people who help keep maintain the ship, from the captain who helped maintain our heading, to the cooks who help delici uh, cook up delicious food every day for us. And I can tell you, it has been quite the treat. So shout out to them for keeping us afloat and all having us on this journey together and exploring the ocean. Super awesome being on a ship with such a diverse crew. People coming from anywhere from Mexico to Brazil to Panama, Honduras. It's really cool. I do need to brush up on my Spanish, though. <laughs> Same here. It's nice to have people to practice with. Yeah. 
it's the best way to learn, I think, conversationally. And I mean, also along with our crew, um, everyone here comes from a different background, different experiences. It's really awesome to be aboard ship with so many different people. It's really great learning about everyone. Kind of represents what we're studying. Lots of biodiversity, <laughs> which is awesome. But yeah, to anyone new, um, we are currently ascending from our last, from our current dive, um, where we will be taking in the samples that we collected, some of which include some, uh, we had a brittle star, I believe. We had a crinoid. We had a bunch of rocks. We also had a brittle star on this rock that we're holding here. Um, not sure if that is still there. <laughs> Hopefully, um, but you'll get to watch us in the wet lab, us being me, Loopy, and Leela in the wet lab, processing those whenever we get up. Um, but for now, we're just ascending and hoping that we see some cool things. We've seen some siphonophores come by, um, some little fishes, some jellies. But yeah, we're just ascending about uh, 20 minutes to the surface and currently Dwight um, and Leela are not present it's just me because we're doing a really exciting ascent <laughs> so I'm acting watch lead for right now doing a great job so far thanks I have a lot of weight on my shoulders but not nice. as much as at this depth Ha ha ha. Nice. <laughs> so here's a question for you. Does the change in pressure ever affect the samples? Or do we ever have uh, containers on the vessel that hold pressurized holds? Um, so, from what I understand, um, we have to be really careful with certain samples because, yes, the pressure, these organisms are experiencing a wild amount of pressure at these depths, and when you bring them up to um, surface, that can be really strenuous on their bodies. Um, so, an example, an unfortunate example of that is the blobfish. That's a really common... Um, depiction from the deep sea um, and I want to say the blobfish was actually I have no idea what the oh let's see it was a sacro sacro looted fish um, but essentially what happened with the blobfish is that because of the pressure um, it just completely kind of melted when it came up to sea so um, in terms of our samples, we, I'm not too experienced. This is my first cruise, but um, our samples have come up unscathed, um, but we've only really brought up coral. Um, we had a crinoid, crinoid, wow, um, and some rocks, but I'm sure with the more gelatinous and fishy things, it can get a little tricky.
So our mission to explore the oceans is supported by other partners that we take along with us. The Ocean Exploration Trust, which Nautilus Live is under, is a part of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. This includes partners such as NOAA Ocean Exploration, Impossible Sensing, the Woods Hole Institute, the University of Rhode Island, University of New Hampshire, and other partners. Many of these institutions cooperate together to help facilitate uh, the larger plan and mission of exploring deep oceans. And they provide different tools and plans to help us execute that. For example, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, the University of Rhode Island has what's called the Inner Space Center. And this is a space that takes internet signal from our ship, from satellites down back to land and processes that in their own mission control. Impossible Sensing is also developing new technologies to help autonomously explore the ocean. So oftentimes we have on our ship uh, other rovers and sea f it, autonomous seafarers that can map the ocean or go into water and surf the ocean without the need of a tether attached to our ship. And no X Owen excuse me, NOAA Ocean Exploration is a part of the federal government and they often provide helpful species IDs for us that we use here on our expedition. Just got an update that we're about 10 to 15 minutes away from the surface. So fingers crossed we see something else cool maybe. And I saw, I saw some questions asking about um, whales. Unfortunately, it's not really whale season, so kind of unlikely that we'll see whales, um, but you never know. There was a spotting of a whale shark, which is not a whale, but just the largest shark species there is. I wish I got to see that, but it seemed really cool. What's what was that? that? On the 4 to 8, saw that? Was that? I think that was last night or the day before. Uh, Megan posted a, um, at least something on Instagram about it. It was really oh, interesting. Wow. Cool. I'll have to go back and look at that. Yeah, um, I forgot who captured it, but they caught it like during the day, just like oh. looking over the ship. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Shark sightings. I'm keen to see one. <laughs> Man. Just got to stand outside and just yes. look over the boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They sense my eagerness. <laughs> and it's because of the shark sightings, it's a big reason why we don't go swimming in the water. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Open waters mean that um, sharks here are kind of just looking for anything to eat. So not a great place to go swimming. Yep. Um, but generally, sharks are kind of um, docile. They kind of don't really look for humans unless you do something to them. Um, but that's in shallower waters where they can kind of eat what they want rather than they have to eat what they can. So that's why it's important to know where you are. So here's a question from somebody from Saudi Arabia. Do we ever find uh, telecommunication pipes? And I think what they mean by that are um, internet cables lying on the ocean floor. Um, sorry, I was like half, well, <laughs> I was half zoning out. Oh, uh, ocean, um, uh, Nautilus does actually assist with the uh, Ocean Networks Canada and part of that cabled observatory I believe has some of those types of cables, but just, I don't, I can't speak to if we've ever just found cable tracks um, for internet. 
but the mm. the ONC um, dive is going to be later in the summer. That's a very cool ROV uh, manipulating and getting the, the uh, instruments onto that observatory. It's very cool to watch. Nice. Will Nautilus be on that one or yes. will it be different? Yeah. Cool, cool. I also wanted to say, Salon, it's my final Middle Easter. It's, I know it's late for you right now. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And for those of you all around the world who are just tuning in, welcome aboard. We are the exploration vessel Nautilus, currently exploring the Central Pacific Ocean. Our ROV Hercules and Atalanta are currently ascending from the ocean floor from a 20-hour dive. We explored an unnamed guillot, which was north northwest of the Kingman Reef. This is an area of U.S. territorial waters within the Pacific Rim Islands Marine National Monument. And we lie just outside of that within the U.S.'s exclusive economic zone. These are all a bunch of big words just to describe different ways that we define territory within the ocean. On this dive, we saw many different sea creatures and many different discoveries. If you've been with us, you've probably seen a lot of uh, gelatinous strings floating by, and those are siphonophores. They are related to jellyfish and other sea creatures that don't exactly have a particular way to fit into any other category other than nadarians. Yeah, another, um, some other cool things about siphonophores is that they are, um, they reproduce asexually. So all of the zoids or the little um, animals on the siphonophores, they are um, identical genetically. Um, but yeah, they use jet, propul jet propulsion to get around. So um, some of them quite literally look like rockets. It's really cool. But they generally just kind of vibe in the water column and um, take up whatever they can get from the marine snow and detritus. Um, and some of them actually, they are generally carnivores. They actually do um, predate on small things like copepods, fish, um, arthropods. So the jet propulsion is super helpful in that. Um, but yeah, a lot of them also have um, other adaptations for getting their food, like tentacles. Um, and some can even have toxins in their nematocysts, which are their little stinging cells that help secure their prey. So they're really cool, really awesome. We have about uh, probably eight to 10 minutes before we reach surface. Our calculations are saying about seven actually. So, yep, almost done our ascent. It'll probably be around 100 meters or so that uh, we'll hand off the comms to the ROV team to help with the ascent. We can also see in the live feed that the ocean is starting to get a lot bluer. So, and then we can see the light from the sky coming into view. Yeah, we're finally in the photic zone. Hooray!
The next dive is scheduled for sometime uh, later today, after we get our samples and figure out a dive plan um, and make sure everything is working. But we will be back in the water as soon as possible because we have a lot of ocean to map and a lot of things to see in the sea. Yep, so roughly 70% of our planet is covered in water and yet only 5% of it has ever been explored. So there's still more to come, so stay tuned. And I will say that if you're ever scared of missing anything, um, I know our live stream goes back about, I think, 12 hours, so there's kind of always content to watch. Um, but yeah, we're basically streaming 24-7 right now on our expedition. Um, so even if we're not in the water, we're, you know, we're either in the wet lab, we're um, fixing up things on Perk and making sure everything's okay in the hangar, but we'll generally always have a camera on showing what we're doing. Hey, video, I'm going to go to the, the uh, launch and recover salvo here. Copy, thank you. Yep, so we're passing this on to the RV team to help with the launch and recover. I'll we'll tune in with you guys later. See you in the wet lab. So here, I can want to see good position here. And we'll stop at 50, and if we're way out of whack, we just hold there until we get it straightened out. Okay. All right, stop there. Sarah, right. there you go. Uh, can you tell them to come up uh, at 50 meters, come on up when they're ready at 12 meters per minute or slower? Sharks? Was it a shark? Yeah, it looked like there was like two sharks over there like on the mm -hmm. Atlantis view or so. Maybe it'll come back. There it is. What? Look at it. Oh, I missed it. It says like white tips. Oh, oh yeah. It's the, it's the white tips I saw last night. <laughs> Sarah, you got your shark. <laughs>
Yeah, cool. Oh wow, three. What? Ooh. Oh, there's like, um, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're sniffing our sample box. Oh, this is so cool, all the sharks. Oh wow, that was a good shot. Hmm. I do not. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Wow. Look at 25 it. meters. Roger, 25. Two five meters, I. There's oh three my of them. <gasps> He's got the door. Oh, look. Look. It's coming. Bridge close. Nav. Come closer. No, it left. Go for deck. Go ahead. You reduce stress to 25%. between the goal post right now. Goal. Nice. Okay, you can kill your lights. Happy. Mm, look at it. There you go. And the auto heading is off, right? Yes. Secure the thrusters. Oh yeah, as soon as you left, we saw sharks. They're still, they're still kind of swimming around, see? Well, that's a fish. So start killing the rest. Yeah, you can kill all this stuff now, I think. Yep. Bridge nav. And Jack, Adelina is clear of the water. Should I kill the rest? Copies. What's that? The rest of the cams. Yeah. 
You can leave your ground fault to text stuff. Bridge on. control van. Doesn't matter. Your parallel can go off now too. To, um, the Herc's on the surface. Yep. Nice job. Bridge control van. Okay. You increase thrust to 90% and hold position. Roger. Thank you. There it is. There's our way. Is it like two little fishes oh, swimming no. with it? Or uh -huh. It's like probably, probably some Look associates. At it. Wow. Yeah, it's like two associates. It's beautiful. Oh, there's another one. Can you get the, the bubble cam um, on the gauges better? There we go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, keep him going ahead if he's slipping back. Yep. Yep. Bridge control van. Go ahead. Can we start tracking a line forward at point zero three knots? For anyone who wanted to know, those fish following the okay, Roger. clips are called pilot fish and they are a mutualist species who benefit from um protection from predation and then the shark um, and then they eat parasites off the shark so cool mutualism example and for her like it's hard to know if you're able to do anything in this kind of weather but generally you want to try and like be in the middle while they're dealing with Argus and then as they pass the line over to the crane start driving around with the crane okay. so that he's not having to side load it you can see the line mm -hmm. so trying to come over and accommodate all the time but then you know you have the ship driving ahead and you have like all the weather so in this case probably not doing very much 